So let's say you have several databases you're responsible for monitoring and you need to perform maintenance on them. If you have an administrative database helping you watch them, then you can know immediately when one of them is not in use. You can then use your admin database to lock that database for future logins and prevent other users from getting in while you're trying to perform your maintenance. So let's take a look at how. Hey everybody, this is Ray Harvey. Welcome to part three in our series on building an access administrative database. In today's video, we're going to talk about how to prevent logins of the databases that you monitor. So I'd like to make one quick note about my approach to discussing the code in today's video. This is part three of a series, and I don't want to go through all of the code that we've talked about in part one and part two, because that'll make part three a very lengthy video. So uh, I would suggest either watching part one and two, or at least going to my blog and looking at the code listing for part two. The code listing for part two will have all the code we discussed in part one and part two. And I'll put a link to videos one and two in the description below this video, and I'll also put a link to the code of part two, as well as code in part three on my blog in the description below the video. Let's take a look at the high level approach we were taking in getting the user lists from the databases that we're monitoring. In our previous approach, I set up a loop where we got a list of the databases we're monitoring and for each one, we then open a connection to it, got the user list, inserted those users in a user's logged in table, closed the connection to that database, and then went to the next database in the list and did it all over again. So notice in this approach, we used the same connection object for each database. We would open a connection object to the database, use it, then close that connection, then get the path to another database and op use the same connection object to open that database. We're not going to be able to do that this time because the code that we're using, the Microsoft product code that we're using to lock a database is essentially the same thing as opening a database in exclusive mode. So what that means is if you want to keep a database locked, you can't close your connection to it. You have to keep the connection open. As soon as you close your connection to the database, the database will be able to be opened by anybody at that point. So you have to hold on. At, once you set the, the prevent logins flag, you have to hold it open. So what that means then is, if we're going to monitor multiple databases, I have to have multiple connection objects to work with. And I wanted to make it as generic as possible. I don't want to have a hard-coded connection for each database I monitor because then what happens is when you add a new database to your monitoring list, you have to go into the code and add another connection object to the code and work that into your loop somehow. What I've done in this video is we're going to use an array of connection objects. Okay. And whenever we need to open a new database, we're going to look through that array and find an empty, unused element in the array, add a connection object to it, and then use that connection object to connect to the database. And this will allow us to keep the connections to all the databases we're monitoring open the entire time that our database is running. But keeping the connections open allows us to hold one or more databases locked for as long as we like. So let's run through the approach the new approach really quickly, it's just basically the same list. We're going to get a list of databases we're going to monitor. The change here is that instead of simply opening a connection object, we're going to look at our connection array and see if that database is already there. And if it is, get the element or the index number of that connection and use it going forward through this loop. Or if it's not in our connection array yet, we're going to put it there. And once we know what the index number is of the connection object we want to use, then we'll open it, we'll get the user list the same way, we'll insert those users into the user's login table the same way, and we'll get the next database and do the same loop again until we're done. Let's take a quick look at our form. Physically, the only thing that's changed to our form is I've added a section down here, I've added a, a rectangle and a label uh, called actions, and I've got two new command buttons down here. I've got a command for locking a database and a command for unlocking a database. And the idea is that you would select a database in this list and lock it. And then you can come back and unlock it later. All right, I've got code running on a timer, so we're going to clip, put this back in design view so we don't have that code running while we're in our code editor. So the first new thing we have in our code is this connection array, con array. I've defined it with 25 elements. And they are defined as new, so we don't have to instantiate these objects when we go into our code. They're already instantiated for us. So load jet users, that is the method we were using in video one and two to get our user list from the databases that we're monitoring. So here we have gotten a list of the database we want to monitor and put it in RS2. And we've established a loop for RS2, record set two. 
And one of the first things we do, after making sure we have a valid path, of course, is to, right here, we were opening a connection object to that database. We replaced that statement with a function, find con and array, find connection and array. And this is going to return to us a number that represents the index number of the connection in that array, in that collection. And I want this to do everything. I, I want it to look for this database in that connection array. And if it finds it, return me the element number. If the database is not in that connection array, I want it to go ahead and find the next open spot in the, in the array and put the connection object in there and return that number to me. And finally, if it can't find the database in the connection array and it's out of space, in other words, we've defined this as 25 occurrences. If there's, if I've already got 25 in there, I want it to return a negative one to me so I can then test to see if we've got a big problem. And in that case, we're gonna get out. So the code below here is almost exactly the same, except that everywhere we had our connection object, our hard-coded connection object, we replace it then with with our con array object with the appropriate element number. So here we go. We've opened our, we've gotten our connection. We're coming here to to query our schema to get the user list. We set rs equal to our con array, and then i is the number that was returned by our function up here. And everything else is the same, except that we are not going to close that connection. So let's take a look at this code, find con and array. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna have, a, we have a, a variable here to record the return value of our function. And we're gonna set it equal to negative one right away, just in case we have an error somewhere in the code and uh, we weren't able to set that negative one. Next, we're gonna set up a loop i here is an internal variable to this function and we're going to loop through the from the lower bound of the array to the upper bound of the array and i'm using this instead of hard coding 0 to 24 because if we need to increase the number of elements in our array we can just do that at the very top up where we we dimensioned the array and we won't have to remember to come down here to all these places we're looping through it and change it here as well next we want to look for our string path in the connection string of each of the element arrays, each of the connection objects. So we use the inString function, and this is the string we're going to, re we're going to give it to, to search through, the connection arrays, connection string, and we'll look for the string path, the path of the database that we just passed in. If it finds it, it will set the inString value function to a non-zero number. So let's, find, let's say we found our connection object. We're going to set our return value equal to i. Then we're going to set i equal to the upper bound of our connection array. That will make us pop out of this for loop. And we will bypass this next if and get out. We'll, we'll set the value of our function to the return value and then get out. But let's say we did not find our database path in our connection strings that we have stored in our connection objects right now. We need to make a new entry. So we're gonna test if return is still equal to negative one, we're gonna go in here and we're gonna use this function, find open con array spot. And we'll set i equal to the value that it returns. So find open con array spot is also very simple. We have the same structure here, the return value equal to negative one first. We have the same for loop here from the lower bound to the upper bound of the array. And I found that when these connection objects are first instantiated by that new statement, that it set the provider equal to msdasql. Now if I remove one via the code, I'm going to set it equal to spaces. So if either one of these statements are true, we know that we have an unused array element. So we're going to set our return value equal to i, which is the element we're on. And we're going to set i equal to the upper bound of the connection array, again, to naturally pop us out of this for loop. And we'll set the value of our function to this return value that we just had. And we'll return that back up to here. So now we have the value of an i of an unused spot in our array. Again, we're going to set our return value equal to i, so we get out of our function, we return this new element number. Next, we want, to, we want to set the provider of our connection array element equal to whichever version you need for whatever, whatever version of the database you're monitoring, okay, pre-2007, after 2007. And then we want to open that connection, con array i dot open, and we're gonna give it the path to the database, and then we pass that in to our function here, and then we'll get out. 
and return control back up to find it up to here. So once we've done this, we know which element number in our array our connection object is, and we can use that in our code. So the other code we have to look at then is for how we prevent the users from logging in. So we have a lock button and an unlock button here. Remember the way this was going to work was let's open this guy up. You're going to select a database and lock it. Okay, so this code is going to rely on us having selected the database here and loaded the database ID of this guy into the form level variable that we have set up to keep track of which databases we're working on. Let me put this back in design view. So up at the top here we have here's the click events for our two buttons, the lock button and the unlock button, and they're going to call the same method set db status. So we're going to send a different string parameter to each one. Of course, we're going to send lock for the lock button, and we're going to send unlock for the unlock button. Let's head down here to set db status. So we sent in a string parameter here that holds the word lock or unlock. So we know what to do to the database once we find it. But first, we have to find the database in our connection array, and we're going to do that by using the db for user detail variable that we have at the very top of our form. This is the form level variable that holds the database ID, the primary key of whichever database is selected in this list. When we do the when we click on this list somewhere, it sets this database for user detail variable to the primary key of that database. So we're going to use that to find our database in our connection array. So, so first we're going to query our monitor databases table to get the path from it. So we're going to select the DB path and of course the status, whether it's locked or unlocked, for monitor databases where DBID equals this DB for user detail variable that we just set in that click event. We'll open that record set. We're going to use the same find con array function, passing it the path that we just obtained from this query so we can get the element number of the connection object in that array. Now down here, check it out. We're going to be just super careful. If we can't find that database in the array, we're going to go ahead and do the same thing we did above. We're going to look for an open spot in the array and go through the same code we did above, that is, open, an op open a connection to it and then use that. The next thing we're going to do is put our record set in edit mode. Okay, record set represents the the list of monitor databases and we're showing that on our form. If the status, this is the string we passed in, if the status is locked, we want to lock this database. So here's the connection object pointing to our database, con array i. We're going to set properties and here's your string, your jet OLADB connection control. Set that property equal to 1. 1 is for locking. If we're supposed to be unlocking it, we'll use this else down here and set it to 2. We'll unlock it. If we're locking it, we're going to set the status column of our record set from monitor databases to locked. If we're unlocking it, we're going to get that at, we're going to get that word locked out of that status column. And we're going to update that record set. And the reason we're updating that record set is because it's being displayed, values from it are being displayed in this left form. Because that locked value is going to show up right here if we lock. See, boom. We update that record set. And then we're going to close our record set, but then we're going to have subform db list, which is our left subform, requery itself so that it can show this new status, whatever it is, in the user interface. And then we're going to set focus on the proper record like we did above, like we did in video two. We're going to look for the database ID that we just were working with in the record set of our subform. So that's it for part three of our series. I'm building an administrative database for access databases. Thanks for watching. Hope you got something out of this. And please don't forget to subscribe. And we'll see you next time.